I'm Kat. I'm Haley. And this is Night Classy, the podcast where two teachers unwind, sip wine, and each teach a lesson we can't teach at school. What are we drinking, Haley? We're drinking a wine that has a lot of words in it. <laughs> Specifically, Orleggi de Luberi Cosica 2020, Elaborado y Embotellado en la propiedad roja. <laughs> it really just keeps going. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't stop talking. I feel like that's how I'm going to be after one glass of this wine. Oh, it's very good. Already, oh my God. This one I literally think is my favorite. Really? It's so good. It like, it's very smooth. It's not too like strong, but it also like is full of flavor. Like you don't get that like watery feeling. Yeah. It packs a punch. I kind of yeah. feel like if I was like in karate practice and like I got hit and it was like, oh, like, OK, OK. Like, I know there's there's power behind that punch, but I'm not like on my ass. Yeah. Like you feel the pain, but like it doesn't hurt too bad. You just feel alive. I feel the pain and I like it. Yeah, me too. It also <laughs> like it feels like it would go well with cheese. I know nothing about wine, but it does it taste like a cheese wine. Some good mozzarella sticks. Oh, that's what I'm talking that's about. That's my like, kind of that's cheese. That's the cheese that <laughs> this wine goes with, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know where we can get mozzarella sticks? High Point Grocery. Most likely. I mean, I don't know if, I don't want to call them out if they don't have mozzarella sticks, but they probably do. I would hope so. If not, yeah. I'm going to personally have some issues. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I, half kidding. Half kidding. <laughs> they would have like gourmet mozzarella sticks that are like locally made. Yeah. It would be like salted with Himalayan salt <laughs> from the Himalayas. And, and I mean, not to make them sound like super fancy, like freaking like Whole Foods. They're, it's not like that. They're pretty fancy though. They sell those like charcuterie boards that right. are gorgeous. Not prestigious though. They're not like uppity. Yeah, you can uh, you can go there in your sweatpants. They're like your friendly neighborhood uh, grocery store in Memphis. Yeah, they sure are. They're friendly. They're near. Uh, they're near. <laughs> they're local is what I'm trying to say. Yes. It's a very cute place. You can always find something good in there, just like we find our wines every single week. So we highly recommend you stop in High Point Grocery here in Memphis. The address is 469 High Point Terrace. Yes, and you can get this wine. It costs $14.99. And uh, also, if you're confused about why we're talking about a grocery store, they are our partner, and we are very lucky to have them. Well, we are also very lucky to have someone else here. My mom and my little brother Theo are in the room with us. They're visiting and it feels a little intimidating because they're watching us. Yeah, I'm really nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Say hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Theo's going to run the soundboard with Alec. They might do some fun drops, so get ready for that. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they were practicing. Okay. All right. right. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to hit them with one? Ooh, uh, good choice. Good choice. Do you still have Haley's Because on there? Yeah. That one's my favorite. Okay, hit this one, this, Theo. That was probably Margarita Night. Because, because, I don't know what's not because, I know what it is because, is because, like, because, because, I don't know what's not because, I know what it is because, is because, like. <laughs> what uh, were you talking about? Who knows? <laughs> I want to know, I, I, that was definitely one of the nights where we were, like, recording in our stairwell, right? I have no idea. Probably I I at, like, 2 a.m. Blocked it out of my memory because... Because, uh, <laughs> because, because. <laughs> Those were some rough nights because we were recording, because, because, you know, because we were recording at our house, we would start recording at like midnight and then record until 2 a.m. and then watch Survivor and then stay up all night. Yeah. Early quarantine was like the Wild West. Time literally did not exist. <laughs> we went into a wormhole. In the worst way possible. <laughs> yeah. And now we try to record at like five or six because, you know, the later it gets, the worse we are at doing this. And we were pretty bad at doing it some of those nights at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you all have been with us since those <laughs> nights, like since our podcast started, pretty much started in quarantine, we love you so much. Yeah. Thank you for sticking with us. Shout out to you guys. Every once in a while, I'll get like a DM on Instagram and they're like, yeah, I just came across your podcast. I can't wait to listen. I'm like, oh, gr that's great. You should start at one of our earlier episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I would say... 
to be safe like 10 and on. Like the yeah. crew is still a little rough. Yeah. We've gotten the hang of it. We're learning more every day, but we definitely uh, caught our groove at least after episode three. I feel like the first three were just absolutely quite the, quite the learning journey. <laughs> <laughs> Lifelong learners. That's us. That's us. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so yeah, we have some stage fright here tonight. We had some stage fright last night. We were asked to host an event because of this podcast for Teach for America. And we did that. We oh. did it. Mm-hmm. Nothing like doing a podcast. No, um. <laughs> not not as fun. Not as fun. Not but not quite. It was, it was, I don't know, I got more sentimental than I thought I was going to. Yeah, I suppose. But that journey is behind us. Sure is. Sure is. Done. Bye. Off the checklist. <laughs> but give, we will still be teachers. So. Give me my t-shirt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. My kids like doubled because I, I had like about seven to eight on any given day. And then they came back to school to take the state test. And they had so much fun being back in the building because after their test, we'd take them to the gym and like let them play and they're like this is the best and they got to see their friends and so now they all came back so now I have a lot of kids in my room oh my gosh yeah. that's crazy I'm yeah. losing kids <laughs> yeah I all the other teachers on my hall lost kids because you know after they take the state test like school yeah, like, isn't as serious anymore <laughs> and they the kids feel that and so like everyone else on my hall has like four kids and I have 16 Wow. Yeah. You're but just the fun Because they teacher. love me. Yeah, they want to spend all day in the room with me. They're like, we saw you on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> they found me on TikTok and I was like... Or I told them about TikTok because I found like a new like game, like an educational game on TikTok and they loved it. And I was like, I found this on TikTok and they're all like, we're going to find you on TikTok. And my name at the time was my real name. And I was like, well, I'm changing my name right now. And I pulled out my phone and changed my name to an alias. <laughs> I was like, no, you're not going to find me on TikTok. You've got to. My students won't find me, but my parents on the other hand. <laughs> yeah. I don't need that in my life. Every time I get a follow request on Instagram from someone in Memphis who is like the same age as one of my students parents would be I never accept because I just feel like it might be not that I'm trying to hide anything my Instagram is very clean but I just there's just boundaries yeah just I just separate yeah (laughs) work life balance yeah I don't need social media I don't need to be dm'd about homework assignments Mm -mm. like Send that to my email. No, thank you. Not that I think my parents would do that, but you know. As a matter of fact, don't send it to my email. Yeah, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Just shut up about it. (laughs) As a matter of fact, read the assignment description. (laughs) Twice, just to be sure. Yeah. Um, Well, that's all I got. Do you have anything? No, let's get into it. Jump straight into it. We (laughs) breathalyzed. We did. I blew a point. Zero six nine. Hey, hey. (laughs) And I blew a point zero two eight. Boo. Boring. But that means Haley gets to go first and I get to sit here and drink this really delicious wine. Oh, I'm so nervous. Like my hands are (laughs) sweating. This is intense. (laughs) This is intense. I really feel like I'm being observed right now and I don't like it. We are. We are. I wonder what our our scores will be. (laughs) (laughs) All right. When Maximilian Factorix Immigrated to the United States from Poland in 1904, the American dream and the potential for the American dream was alive and well, and he just wanted a piece of that pie. And I am not sure if I'm butchering this name or not. Fact, Factorowitz. Just call him Max. I'm going to call him Max. Max was a beautician, and he opened up a line of cosmetics, which it was his nickname. He called it Max Factor. And this line specialized in movie makeup. Him and his family eventually settled in Los Angeles in 1909. And Max saw and filled the demand for made-to-order wigs. He also experimented with grease makeup that was made specifically for people in movies and on the screen. And he also helped the industry adapt to the shifts from silent films to the films with sound in them. One of the big changes was the lights that they used and silent films. The lights were really loud. They gave off a lot of noise. 
So when the sound was able to be in the film, they had to change the lights and everything, which also affected how the makeup looked on people's skin. Okay, yeah, I was wondering how makeup would have to change. Yeah, you, the, it's the little things, yeah. right? <laughs> so he really was a, a big part of the filmmaking industry. Max's company became the go-to for all film makeup and is still around today 112 years later the company stayed in the family for generations until its sale in 1973 and then it was eventually sold again to Procter and Gamble in 1991 Max Factor sold it for approximately three b -b billion dollars in today's money and it's safe to say that Max achieved the American dream. Yeah. He left plenty of money for generations to come. The Factor family was heavily involved in the arts and philanthropy, but every family has the weird uncle and the <laughs> fucked up cousin. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Enter Andrew Luster, great-grandson of Maximilian Factorwix, if that's even how you say it. So everyone in that family was set for life, including Andrew Luster. He was born in 1963 and grew up in Malibu. He later ended up just living off a cool million dollar trust fund in a cottage on the beach. Very cushy. A million dollars won't get you that far. It got him far enough. Yeah. Got him far enough. They could have given him more. Um... They could have. They yeah, should have. They, they should have. I mean, he yeah. was the great grandson and he's the fucked up cousin. So you can only get so far. I, f I would give the fucked up cousin all my money and then <laughs> give it to them to deal out to the rest of the family. You know, just to watch they the show. They wouldn't. Just, just to, <laughs> to watch. Oh, my God. That's Claudia Severe talking <laughs> early on the track tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We just need to, uh, okay, everyone listening, go donate to our Patreon. Make Night Classy like a multi-million dollar conglomerate. And then watch me just fuck with my family with all that money. <laughs> Oh my God. It'll be like the Hunger Games. <laughs> I would love to see. We should compare with like, I guess we should just play Monopoly. Because I was like, we should pretend that we won the lottery <laughs> and then say what we would do with our money. But we should just play Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm. <laughs> we should just play Monopoly. Also, I hate Monopoly. I do too. Let's it's not. so boring. We should never play Monopoly. <laughs> well, okay. That's fine with me. That's fine with me. Okay, so you would want to give all the money to this Andrew guy to watch the world burn. The world did burn. He led a really uninhibited lifestyle in the worst way possible. Trigger warning, I'm going to talk about rape and sexual assault for a moment. In 2000, a student at a local college went to the police to report her own rape, which happened at this guy's house. Factorowix, Maximilian, probably rolled in his grave after the investigation to his great-grandson revealed some pretty disturbing stuff. He was charged with drugging three young women, raping them, and recording the sexual assault. Oh, my God. They found these videotapes while searching his home. Whoa. And there's no way that was the first time. Yeah. For some, like, to go that far. Right. To do, like, yeah, to and only, assault like, three, three times. people at the same time and record it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. probably a pattern. It's what happens when you have all the money from your... <laughs> but hierarchy. again, it's only a million dollars. I mean, money can grow, Kat. But it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like he uh, was an investor. I mean, maybe. I guess I don't know anything about him, but he... They probably had he, connections and he was able to make his money grow. If he was born in 63 and then this happened in 2000... Oh, he was born in 63? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so he was old. I mean, he was like in his 40s. Yeah, I was I was picturing <laughs> like a young guy. No. Like a 17-year-old. No, he's not a college student. He's okay. like in his 40s when this happened. Okay. Um. So he did have time for money to go. I don't know. Either way, he had a million dollar trust fund. <laughs> he was poor. <laughs> he had only a million dollars. And yeah, like near Los Angeles, his cottage was like $600,000. So who knows? Who knows? But nonetheless, he was arrested. He was put in jail. But then he paid a million dollar bill. How? 
<laughs> because that, you have to pay like 10% was that all his money <laughs> <laughs> yeah he just like closed out his Roth IRA and <laughs> <laughs> that was that <laughs> And apparently he was a man with a plan because he did not come to court after he had posted his bail. I mean, why would you? Because it's the law. Because that's what you do. If I got arrested and paid my bail, I would not go back. Where would you go? Mm, I don't know, but not to jail. (laughs) (laughs) I would probably I would definitely go like, first of all. I would never go to jail. (laughs) Second of all, (laughs) I'm such a good, sweet angel that like I would definitely I would cry and I'd be like, let me just not even post my bail. Like, I'm so guilty. I deserve this. I deserve this. I should think about what I did. (laughs) No, in reality, I would definitely go back. And also, I mean, never say never. Like uh, people end up in jail for not a good reason all the time. That's true. Maybe I would. But this was a good reason. (laughs) Yeah. This was one of the best reasons. <laughs> yes, this, in this case, but I'm, if, if I were in jail, like, it's possible. It's possible. Not well, that I purposely do anything bad, but... Who never, knows? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> he did not go back to court. They still convicted him guilty in absentia, and he was sentenced to 124 years absentia. in prison. Absentia. Thank you. I'd never, like, read that word out loud before. Yeah, that's a weird word. Absentia. Yeah. <laughs> absentia. <laughs> absentia. <laughs> absentia. My aunt Sentia. Absinthe? Ooh, absinthe. Let's go to absinthe room after this. Okay, I'm down for that. (laughs) But the one issue in this case was that they couldn't find his sleazy ass. Several months go by and his case is getting so much attention due to his family's status and their wealth and all that. But fear not, in June, so a couple months later, Andrew Luster was captured in Mexico by a bounty hunter named Dwayne Chapman. You probably know him as Dog, Dog the, the Bounty, bounty Hunter. hunter. <laughs> probably the best TV show that's ever been on TV. Oh, we're going to get into <laughs> it. <laughs> Andrew Luster is still incarcerated today for the rest of his life at Valley State Prison. But um, he got life. He got life. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. good. He deserves it. But like, you wouldn't expect you the wouldn't justice expect system it. to like yeah. really, yeah. Especially someone with money. I know. Yeah. I, it's shocking. Good for them. Yeah. And I think he also got more time because he, he skipped yeah, mm-hmm. he skipped out on that. Because dog had something to do with it. They're like, we can't disrespect our dog. Well, he was not famous then. Oh, this is this got, what is got the him thing famous? that made him famous. Wow, sure is. So, really, this whole learning journey is. I started thinking about Dog the Bounty Hunter, and I was like, <laughs> "Who is this man? He's so crazy." And what is a bounty hunter, and how do you become one? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> wow, what a what a learning journey already. I thought it was going to be about makeup, and then I thought it was going to be about this guy. And now we're talking about fucking Dog the Bounty Hunter. How did we get here? I'm just trying to give you some whiplash. I'm trying to fake you out. (laughs) Yeah, I usually write down the subject first. And I was like waiting and waiting and waiting. And I was like, oh, what's it going to (laughs) be? Yeah, I love it. it, Well, is it about Dog the Bounty Hunter enough that our title can be Dog the Bounty Hunter? Okay, so here's the thing is that I do not want to idolize him at all. He's pretty shitty and problematic to say the least. I did not know that. Too late, guys. (laughs) <laughs> I'm so uh, sorry. No, I don't want to center him, but he's yeah. just so crazy yeah. that I also, also wanted to learn about him a bit. I want to backtrack because I said that was the best show that's ever been on TV. <laughs> <laughs> And I actually, I don't think I've ever watched a full episode. I just thought that was funny. It is a really crazy show. Like, I can't believe that bounty hunters are even a thing. Like, what the hell? How is that real? (laughs) Just make the police do their jobs, right? What if you're like, okay, I take back what I said. Dog the Bounty Hunter was not the best show on TV. The show that he came out with afterwards, Dog Unleashed, (laughs) is the best show on TV. Amen. (laughs) Amen. And the best hair on TV. Oh, definitely. That that part's true. He could use some deep conditioning besides that. Mm. 10 out of 10. Yeah. Imagine (laughs) if his mullet was like smooth and luxurious. I don't think he would be a bounty hunter. 
I think he would. What if? What if as soon as he got famous and got money, what he did was get like a bunch of deep conditioning treatments and fix his hair? That would be what I would flow. do. Me too. <laughs> I mean, he does have a flow. Also, yeah. I was looking at pictures. Like, is that real hair? And it. it is but what if it was one of those hats that has fake hair? Oh like, sewn into my it? god, that would be <laughs> phenomenal. Because doesn't he wear a baseball cap? No, oh, he does. No, it's like a tuft on the top of his head, and his hairline is receding, but it's still long. Like it's really starting to go away up top, but his hair's long, and okay. you know it's all raggedy. Yeah. Also, it looks like it was a really bad bleach job, but I think that's yeah. just the color of his hair. Really? Because it looks like a yellow, like straw. Raw hair. Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm bad. I'm sure he like chain smokes and yeah. yeah. We're looking at pictures. And does of him right not now. use conditioner. He uses Absolutely a, not. Axe two in one. <laughs> <laughs> he always oh has God. on those a freaking Oakley like bug eye <laughs> sunglasses. And his sunglasses are like not on his eye, like no, like what are they he even wears resting them. on? He'll, they'll, he'll, they'll, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> he'll rest them on his brow bone. Yeah, they're not touching pictures. his. Uh, oh, even above that, yeah, he looks really. Wow. He's never heard of sunscreen. I he can looks tell like you that. Freddy Krueger. Yeah, <laughs> he looks. Yeah, leather face, man. He, he's pretty rough. I. He kind of looks like if Joe Rogan didn't have money. He's like if Joe yeah. Rogan and Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Merged. Yeah, with he, like someone from Def Leppard. He looks very. He looks rough, and yeah, now he's wearing his sunglasses on his brow bone as if he has four eyes. He does that constantly. He always has his sunglasses with him. He and what do we think about his hair? Terrifying. Did he dye it? Um, Did, like it I, definitely uh, looks bleached to me. But yeah. like, I also, can't decide. I've never seen his roots though. Maybe he has gray. <laughs> maybe maybe he had blonde hair and then he went gray and now he like bleaches it and tones it to look blonde instead yeah. of gray because he he definitely looks like he does have fair hair like his <laughs> his beard and his eyebrows are pretty light yeah of all the things I want to know about him <laughs> I need to know about his hair. his hair routine I don't need to know the skin routine because yikes no but <laughs> absolutely <laughs> not the hair. he needs moisture in every aspect of his life <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we're going to learn about him. So his name is Dwayne Chapman. He was born February 2nd in 1953 in Denver, Colorado. He's had five wives. Fun fact. Could be more. Could be more. He married his fourth wife after arresting her on a drug charge. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Oh <laughs> um, and that concludes our lesson on <laughs> Bounty Hunters. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so he arrested her. She became his secretary, and they got married. <laughs> That's cute. Super cute. It's kind of like how we met. <laughs> Who's who? Who's not the at all. man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before his collection of ex-wives, Dog ran away from home at the ripe age of 15 years old. He joined the Devil's Disciples, an outlaw motorcycle club, and this is actually where he picked up the nickname Dog. According to him, he was physically the smallest. He's like 5'7", and he said that he had the biggest mouth to start all the fights. Okay. So there's that. <laughs> Imagine being the one that starts fights in your motorcycle gang called Devil's Disciples. Like you're <laughs> that you're the most aggressive one of mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and there's yeah. something about that like toxic masculinity where yeah. he's the shortest and probably there's like pressure for him to be yeah. like don't mess with me. Yeah, definitely. I'll fight you. Not physically, but verbally. <laughs> <laughs> you're going down. <laughs> So obviously, Dog was not surrounded by upstanding citizens who were like doing community service all the time. <laughs> in 1979, he was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Dog was not the killer, but he was in the getaway car while his friend um, killed this 69 year old during a drug deal gone Whoa. bad. Whoa. Mm hmm. So Dog was sentenced to five years in prison, but he only ended up serving about two years. During his stay in prison, a few life changes happened. A, his first wife out of five, almost six, because he has a new fiance, okay. um, his first wife, LaFonda, divorced Doug. 
while he was in jail. But she also divorced him to marry his best friend. <laughs> nice. Relatable. <laughs> B. <laughs> Dog had to do a lot of labor in prison, but he also had a side gig as the warden's barber. Wait. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no thank you. No thank you. Nobody needs the Dog the Bounty Hunter aesthetic. No. Also, <laughs> wouldn't you be scared as a as that warden? Yeah. Like, here, I'm going to give this violent criminal scissors and let him cut my hair while he's in jail and I'm the... Yeah. How about you shave my five o'clock shadow with this with sharp this ass razor? razor. <laughs> yeah. Do, I mean, I'm all for rehabilitation and prisoners having jobs. Like, if you want to go yeah. cut hair after jail, but dog does not look like a trustworthy guy I just wouldn't want him anywhere near me I think that's where this is coming from mm -hmm. I just would not want him that close to my face definitely I did not expect that either no and apparently one day while dog was outside doing physical labor, another inmate was attempting to escape from the jail. And it was this wild situation going down. The guards were about to shoot this guy who's trying to escape. And while he's trying to escape, dog tackles this guy before they could shoot him. And everyone Whoa. was like, yay, OMG, you did it, dog, yeah. And a correction officer congratulated him on a job well done. And that's when he was like, I know what I want to do with my life. Oh. <laughs> I mean, he is kind of like a dog. He is. And that's another <laughs> one that like backs up his yeah. nickname is that he'll he'll hunt you down. Wow. Like a dog. Wow. Yes. So that's how he knew he wanted to be a bounty hunter. But... What is a bounty hunter and how do you become one, you may ask? <laughs> Before we go into this next part of our learning journey, it is important to recognize the issues with A, even the option of being able to pay bail to get out of jail. That's a huge issue. It is classist and there's a lot of inequity in that. And B, there's a lot of issues with, at least in the U.S., the prison system in general. So please keep that in mind as we go through this learning journey. <laughs> so in most states, bail bondsmen and bail recovery agents, aka bounty hunters, they're both classified under the title bail agent, but despite being two completely different jobs. So your bail bondsman is the person who fronts the money for people to get out of jail before their trial. And a bounty hunter is the person who works typically for the bondsman. They're the person who is crazy enough to go and track someone down who's evading the law and skipping out on, on their trial. So the bounty hunter's job is to track them down, arrest them, and return them for their court date. And in return, they get paid. Do you want to guess the average salary for a bounty hunter in Tennessee? $35,000. Higher, baby. Like way higher? Um, Like 10000 grand higher. Okay, so no. <laughs> they make as much as teachers. Exactly. 45000 were the same as a bounty hunter. <laughs> I'd I mean, much rather teach. Regards of salary, yeah. yes. <laughs> we're not commenting on our students at all. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah. That could have that sounded bad. No. Yeah. Purely, <laughs> we have the same salary. <laughs> So some do make salary as bounty hunters. Some of them make commission and charge a percentage of the fugitive's bail amount. Or if you're Dog the Bounty Hunter, you get your own TV show. <laughs> <laughs> the rules and regulations around the actual operations of bounty hunters are murky at best, and they vary from state to state. So take Kansas and Idaho, for example. They have some of the loosest rules for bounty hunters, despite legislators trying to tighten things up for years. In these states, bounty hunters are required to wear badges and just let law enforcement agents know that they're trying to arrest someone before they do it. Okay. So you could be a bounty hunter. Apparently <laughs> the snap so. of a hat. Yeah. Just the buy snap a of a hat. That was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just buy it. like a police costume badge from Amazon. Yeah. And here I go. 
You could probably like borrow someone's Halloween costume yeah. from last year. To be <laughs> I'm a wearing bounty like hunter. a Reno 911 booty short. <laughs> yeah, police costume from <laughs> bounty hunting. Okay, Reno 911 is one of my favorite TV it's shows. It's amazing. We should watch it tonight. We should, yeah. and that's something we can easily follow through Easy. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And okay, although bounty hunting is illegal at a federal level, state laws vary. <laughs> Illinois, Kentucky, Oregon, and Wisconsin have completely banned commercial bonds, which makes it illegal to be a bounty hunter. Thank God. Uh, yeah, thank what's God. What's wrong with all the other states? What's wrong with our entire prison system? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> also, I was really surprised by Kentucky having banned yeah. commercial bond. I wonder why that is. I have no clue. Yeah. No clue. So in some states, a bounty hunter would need a license. Some don't. Some need formal education, like going to get at least your associates in criminal justice. Some don't. Some states literally let anyone be a bounty hunter. Yeah, I thought I, I did. I apparently did not know what bounty hunters were because I literally thought it was just like free agents who uh, like saw that there was like a reward, like a police reward for bringing someone in. And they were just like doing that. That's I didn't pretty realize close. That they worked for like bondsmen. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's how it was before, and we'll get into mm. the history of okay. bounty hunters a little bit because that's how it was. Like when you would see like wanted yeah. posters, a reward, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, maybe I just learned about bounty hunting from like old cowboy movies. Yeah, and that was <laughs> accurate then. Yeah, <laughs> like I think it was a bounty hunter who captured Billy the Kid. I believe. Ooh, that's don't quote me on interesting. that. I don't know. I'm pretty sure though. The statistics on bounty hunting aren't perfect. Believe it or not, there's no hub for reporting data. But the president of the National Association of Fugitive Recovery Agents, Chuck Jordan, which also is a fitting name, Chuck sounds like a bounty hunter it type does. deal. Yeah, <laughs> he said a realistic estimate would be 90 percent plus of defendants released on bail bond that fail to appear are captured and returned to custody prior to the final judgment of forfeiture. Wow. So it is effective. It is highly effective. OK. Which I guess is why people do it. I don't yeah. really know why people do it, but that seems like a reason. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. They do typically have to be licensed through the state that they operate in. And this license also requires formal training for most states. Um, but like I said, it's like the Wild West. In some states, they have to pass a comprehensive exam. Some states do allow bounty hunters to carry firearms. Some do not. So like... What the hell? Dog the bounty... I know. <laughs> I know. What is... Our, our non-American listeners right now are just like, are you guys okay? Yeah. <laughs> like, where like, do you live? Are they speaking English? Yeah. Are we? Yeah. They're like, this is the, this is the call. This is, uh -huh. the, this is their call for help. We need to go get the, truly come get us, help us. <laughs> I, I am looking at a picture of Dog the Bounty Hunter right now and I'm not okay for many reasons. I know. I Can you imagine? Help. Also, like, he's a convicted <laughs> felon. He's a convicted felon who's yeah. a bounty hunter now. <laughs> and a good one. He, so good he has his own TV show. <laughs> yeah. It's probably just because, you know, you can't look away. And not for a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is just the case of, you know, how like your most challenging student in your class is always the one that loves to tattle on other students the most. Yes. That's what this like, is. Look in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just please right, <laughs> reflect. Just, yeah, just let's take a minute and think about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he can't have a gun with him. They pretty much, from what I've seen, because I remember vividly watching Dog the Bounty Hunter on family vacations. <laughs> like would. falling asleep to dog the bounty hunter <laughs> well because it was on like discovery channel or something and you'd be a &E. like watching annie okay uh -huh. never mind i was like not not no. discovery. okay <laughs> that makes more sense you'd be watching duck dynasty and then uh, dog the bounty hunter would come on and who would have thought that those two things would go together <laughs> i feel like you're just picturing like you're imagining what it's like to grow up in the midwest and you're like <laughs> i think they watch the duck show right. and that seems like it would be related to dog Dog the Bounty Hunter. Dogs, yeah. ducks, alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> Dogs and ducks. I have a bumper That's sticker a on show my truck that says that. <laughs> so you definitely do have to be trained 
in at least self-defense to protect yourself and also the fugitive to return them safely. I feel like I need to be trained in self-defense to protect myself from bounty hunters. (laughs) Yeah, you really do. You never know. Mm -hmm. You truly never know. And they also do apprenticeships so that they can get real world experience. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about the history of bounty hunters. It goes all the way back to 13th century England. And back then, the bounty to be won was not money, but someone's life. The court would appoint someone to basically babysit a fugitive and make sure that they arrived at trial. If the court-appointed babysitter did not deliver the fugitive, the babysitter would be the one to stand trial in place of the accused. (laughs) I uh, love old laws. Can you imagine if the district was like, all right, teachers, if this, like, the student's attendance is your attendance? Uh, Pretty much. Pretty much. (laughs) We are held accountable for that at times. But we shouldn't be. No. No. We shouldn't be. Just just like these freaking <laughs> babysitters. <laughs> so if the court-appointed babysitter didn't deliver them, yeah, they were the ones to stand trial. And it doesn't mean that they just stood in place. Of course, it means that they would also get the punishment <laughs> of the accused, which was almost always to be hanged. That is so wild. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so wild because the prison system makes just as much sense now as it did in the Middle Ages. It's like one of the most important things like that makes society go round and yet no one puts any thought into it. They're just like, this would be interesting. Yeah. Cool. (laughs) Cool, cool, cool. They're like, this is going to be a great laugh on a podcast one day. (laughs) (laughs) And we are making their dreams reality. Mm -hmm. So that's how it was for a long time. In 1679, the British Parliament passed the Habeas Corpus Act, which allowed people to post bond and be released from jail before their trial. And then the U.S. also adopted the Habeas Corpus Act. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Okay, good. And that was in 1789. And then in 1873, the U.S. Supreme Court case, Taylor v. Tainter. (laughs) (laughs) Tainter? Barely know her. (laughs) Tainter, I love to. (laughs) Wanted. Tainter. Reward. (laughs) $10,000. (laughs) <laughs> so Taylor vs. Tainter allowed <laughs> allowed bounty hunters to act as the agents of bondsmen. This also allowed them to pursue to pursue to pursue fugitives in other states and to break into fugitives' homes without a warrant in order to bring them to justice. So they're like, what? we're not going to ask any questions, like. What I'm getting from this is that the police have to have a warrant to break and enter. Uh Uh-huh. But these random people with no certifications and guns. And guns. And dog the bounty hunter hair. (laughs) That's the scariest part about him is his hair. His hair and the fact that he's never worn sunscreen in his life. I know. Like, they definitely have lotion in jail. <laughs> At the very least, lotion, right? Right. I mean, he was cutting a hair like a gas to be paid uh, in yeah. lotion. The warden's hair of all people. Yeah, just, I mean, if you're desperate, just take some of that hair conditioner and put it on your face. Whatever you have to do, do it. Right. Mayonnaise will also work. An yes. egg. Yeah. Good God. Butter. Please, for the for the sake of rest, the rest of us. <laughs> I know. I can't look at this anymore. I'll get it off my screen. It's scary. <laughs> I took a great screenshot of you guys with oh him boy. on there. That's good. I look so pretty next to him. Yeah. Yeah. He makes us look really yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Instant confidence boost. Everyone just print out a picture of Dog the Bounty Hunter. Post it to your mirror. Yeah. So every morning you feel... Beautiful. Oh my God. It would be a pretty funny sketch to do like a commercial where it's like Dog the Bounty Hunter's hair and skin line. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, first I take sandpaper to my face. (laughs) 
Do you want skin and hair like this? <laughs> I thought you were going to say a great product idea would be selling Dog the Bounty Hunter mirrors where like he is like painted onto a mirror. It's like, yeah, it's like he's always yeah. right there in yeah. contrast. <laughs> That I think both of those would be a good thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> so being a bounty hunter has come a long way since your average Joe. I mean, I guess it still is your average Joe who could your just average dog. hunt down your average dog. Woof woof. Could just hunt down your average fugitive and arrest them themselves. Today's bounty hunters are required different levels of training, ranging from none to some. And they could also be podcast hosts based on how much research they have to do to catch these people. From what I understand, the view that we get of bounty hunting in media is a lot more physical than what it actually is. A lot of it is research into who they are hunting so that they can easily go and scoop them up, like checking out their social media profiles, all that stuff. They're basically like private investigators who get the job done, I yeah. guess. Do they physically bring people in or do they just figure out their location and then call the police? They physically bring them in. What the fuck? Which is like, also, you could just call the police. Right. Why? Why? Because they want the money. I don't, I don't know. But we're about to talk about the time that Dog did physically bring someone back, backtracking to when he tracked down Andrew Luster in Mexico. So obviously Andrew Luster was in a ton of trouble. But the fact that Dog and his team got Andrew Luster also got Dog into a bit of trouble. As we know, the United States is unique. In so many ways, one of them being the rules and laws with bounty hunters. Everywhere else in the world, bounty hunting is just called kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> the only other place that has a bond system anything like the U.S. is the Philippines. So things are different. Uh-huh. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. cool. <laughs> It just cuts like it zooms out yeah. from this room and we see the globe and the U.S. is just on fire. I really, like, feel, <laughs> I really feel like the U.S. is just every other country's reality TV show. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Yes. Trashy, mm -hmm. dirty. Yeah. But very highly entertaining. entertaining. Like yes. the best to watch. You can't look away. You uh, In the worst way. No. Just like Dog. He is like the vision of the average American. And that's probably why he's so popular, despite being so problematic. Uh -huh. But we'll we'll get to that later. Yeah. So Luster was on the run in Mexico, and Dog was hunting him with his son Leland and his friend Tim. They find L Lester, and they capture him in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, but we're going to move on. After discovering the secret identity that Luster was using, they were able to grab him, put him in their van, and start making their way back to the U.S. So they do that. The Mexican police pull them over, and everybody in that bitch was arrested. Uh, yeah, as they should be kidnapping yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and since they were in mexico dog and his accomplices were not protected under the bounty hunter laws of the u.s because they had kidnapped lester in the eyes of the mexican government and yeah. the rest of the world they were released on bail from the mexican jail but they fled the country <laughs> <laughs> oh, how the turntables. <laughs> Again, it's that kid who likes to tattle on everybody else. And they get rewarded by getting yeah. a TV show out of this whole situation. Right. Yeah. So they flay, they flee, they flayed, they flee the scene. They remained out on international bail, which I feel like anything, any word that you put international in front of, I'm 100% going to to take it way more seriously. Yeah. <laughs> International bail. They're out on this for years and until just days before their statute of limitations expired, Dog and his associates were arrested by U.S. Marshals and jailed in Hawaii for the Mexican government. And I don't want to like bore you all with the legal mumbo jumbo, but here's the basics of what you need to know. Dog, his son, and his friend were released on bail 
again after being arrested in Hawaii. Dog was still being charged by the Mexican government with a felony, despite his lawyer arguing that because they translated his charges from Spanish to English, technically the translation said that what he did was just a misdemeanor in America. (laughs) So I don't know who the heck he... uh, lawyered up with but I would not recommend his crazy cousin yeah (laughs) they had to wear ankle monitors but dog and his associates were able to get their ankle monitors off so that they could continue working as bounty hunters and because of this whole incident and being the one who had captured this Andrew Luster guy dog became successful with his show dog the bounty hunter did he have the show while he was like on the run from the Mexican government yeah because it was years like years went on I think it was like three years that he was out on international bail what is wrong with us so many things (laughs) America needs a therapist yeah (laughs) needs help And also an open letter is sent to Condoleezza Rice from 29 Republican congressmen who are opposing Dog's extradition and asking her to stand with them. There are so many Republicans who stand up and they're like, we stand with Dog. (laughs) Pick something better. (laughs) Pick something better. Like, (laughs) who cares? Yeah. Who cares? So, yeah. Okay. The case was halted due to a completely different thing. Basically, the Mexican government, somewhere along the line, they're like, we need more evidence to be able to like fully try these people. And then eventually Mexico moves forward with the trial. But even more state representatives in the U.S. come forward to ask Mexico to reconsider the charges against Dog, who at this point is a TV star. Yeah, they just didn't want their favorite TV show to be canceled. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what are we supposed to watch now? Yeah. All we have is Fox and Dog. (laughs) Fox and the Hound. (laughs) That's what I watch. (laughs) And you know what? It worked. Eventually, all the charges are dropped since the statute of limitations had expired and he had all these people backing him. Oh, my God. In 2007... Dog said some really fucked up racist stuff on the phone to his son, and he was rightfully canceled from there from a lot of people, but also a lot of people came and backed him. I don't even want to give, like, light of day to the things that he yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. Fun fact about Dog, he's banned from the UK. He can't go over there He should be banned from everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he really should be. So... That was my learning journey. Wow. You know everything you should need to know about bounty hunting and dogs and ducks and <laughs> hounds. I know more than I ever needed to know, and I very much regret. <laughs> Me too. But also and everything I said at the beginning yeah. of this lesson. <laughs> I know, right? And that's where I was like, I knew that he said some stuff in 2007, but yeah. we were so young that I didn't quite remember. So I was like, a dog the bounty hunter, that would be a fun, crazy kind of lesson yeah. and then I got into it I was like oh my god should I even do this and I was yeah. like I'm in too deep like we just have to recognize that he's shitty yeah we'll just call it bounty hunting yeah <laughs> but yeah it's like dog I mean, with an asterisk for the O right <laughs> I mean looking at him like I could probably tell you that he said some problematic shit so I guess I shouldn't have jumped the gun there and said it was my favorite show <laughs> when I've never seen an episode <laughs> Yeah, I would say stand, keep that train of thought for like all things in life. Like yeah. until you experience it or learn about it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's like a YouTube apology video where you're like, it's the best show ever. And then yeah. just smash cut, hey guys. Just, yeah, it flashes to me wearing a sweatshirt with my hood up, crying, no makeup on, and my YouTube oh confessional. My in a previous episode, yeah. I said Dog the Bounty Hunter was, quote, the best show ever. <laughs> We all, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> and not um, not the same as dog, though. No, so no, you've no, got no. That My mistakes were not as bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd venture to say not even close. <laughs> not even close. All right. Well, my sources were Wikipedia for Dogs Page, Andrew Luster, Max Factor, Bail Bonds, Bounty Hunters, Bounty Hunter, edu.org. 
Org. Wow. wow. Yes, ma'am. Look at you. Edu mm-hmm. and dot org. Wow. So I don't know if that means they cancel out. Like, is this a fake? Like, <laughs> <laughs> a fake dot org? Who knows? I don't know. Mentalfloss.com and amomama.com, their news section for things about bounty hunters, and an article uh, from The Guardian about. Dwayne Chapman, a.k.a. Dog the Bounty Hunter. That was my learning journey. Wow. Thank you. Ver- Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. I owe it all to dog. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I have, I owe to dog. <laughs> Especially my stance in everything political. <laughs> Dog is God, spelled backwards. That was literally in one of the articles that I read. Somebody was talking nice. about like they were praising him. So try wow. to be careful. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. We will be right back. My friend Alex texted me today and she was like, hey, so do you guys like actually really like Seventh Hill CBD stuff? And I could not reply quick enough. Like I wanted to get out all of my feelings about Seventh Hill CBD, but the only thing I could say was yes, explanation point. (laughs) And then she was like, okay. And, and then I was like still typing for minutes later. (laughs) Yeah, truly. I, I don't want to say my favorite part about recording is uh, gassing up Seventh Hill CBD (laughs) because the lessons are great, but like, I truly love it. And anytime I can tell someone about this, like not even just CBD in general, because I never honestly liked CBD until I had Seventh Hill CBD because this stuff is actually effective. And if you are wondering if we actually like it, I literally just ordered some this week because Alec and I ran out of our unwind CBD oil. And when I was on their website going to order more, I noticed that they had a double strength one and it's double the strength for not double the price. So I'm like, I can get this if I really need extra, I can have it that night, but like, or I can just use half as much and get the same effect for like a little cheaper. It's just like amazing. I'm truly obsessed. It is not a good night without it. You've got options and that's what we all love and need. I also ordered a like re-up yeah. <laughs> this the week and I'm gonna like Mother's Day will, will have already passed, but I got some for my mom for Mother's Day. She's struggling with her spine and stuff and I'm like I know exactly what you need besides doctors okay? right, right. <laughs> if you're looking for something to add to your actual medical treatment or if you're like maybe not like quite in need of medical treatment but you're a little sore and need something to ease those muscles definitely check out 7th Hill CBD it is the high, like some of the highest quality CBD on the market we can truly attest it is farm to table they do everything themselves it is organic and pure and just absolutely amazing so if you are interested which i'm sure you are head to seventhhillcbd.com and enter our code night classy the name of this podcast to get 20 percent off your order you are going to be so glad you did we can't wait to hear about your experience with seventh hill cbd code night classy 20 percent off buy it <laughs> All right. Welcome to my classroom, everybody. And it is really like my classroom because this is a topic suggested to me by a student. Wow. Student recommendations coming in hot. I know. And I mean, not really suggested to me because he doesn't know about the podcast, but I was told about this by a student. So shout out, Isaiah. Thank you. And this is the Max Headroom Signal Hijacking. My mom's making a face. She knows what this is. And uh, before I get started, I also need to shout out a man named Chris Niddle because he wrote a Vice article where I got pretty much all my information Nice. and uh, pretty much followed his same form out of the article. So shout out to you, Chris. Couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> <ya. laughs> all right. So I'm going to take you back to November 22nd, 1987. And uh, there's this Chicago news channel and it's channel nine. They're doing the nine o'clock news. Everything's normal. It's a basic day. Their sportscaster, Dan Roan, was reporting on the Bears victory over the Detroit Lions. I don't know what sport that is. I don't care. Football. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Football. Yeah. Cool. Because Alex's dad is a big Detroit football guy. All right. Tigers, you know. Nice. So, yeah, football. Um, And then (laughs) suddenly as he's doing this really boring report, the signal flickered and the broadcast went black. 
Then it turned back on, but not to the news. On the screen was a short figure wearing a suit, and he was wearing a rubber mask of a, what looked like a cartoon man. It had sunglasses on and a huge smile, and like think maybe kind of like a cross between Richard Nixon and the Joker. Ooh. That was that was Chris's description. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> and this figure is kind of bouncing around on the screen and there's this like wavy like piece of metal spinning behind him. Think kind of like a warehouse door, like a U-Haul door, like that wavy metal. And it's spinning and you don't hear anything just like light static. And I have a picture of what this looked like. That's what it was. Ooh, scary. Yeah. I do not like that at all. His eyes are completely dark white. So he's wearing sunglasses, you said? Uh-huh. Okay, that makes sense. I thought they were just sunken <laughs> in. I completely forgot the thing you said 30 <laughs> seconds ago. Um, yeah, and it just looks like bars behind him. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you said it was a short figure. I can't really tell that by the picture. His, maybe his shoulders look small, but yeah. the mask looks huge. Yeah, I think that's why he looks short is because his head looks so big. And you see this for about 30 seconds, and then the newsroom technicians were able to take the signal back, and the newsroom reappeared on people's TVs. You see Roan sitting at the desk, and he's kind of smiling nervously into the camera. And he says... If you're wondering what just happened, so am I. And just kind of like awkwardly <laughs> chuckles. <laughs> That's like you when I'm stuttering and trying to figure out what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Federal officials were immediately called in to investigate. Like people were freaked out, but they didn't know where to start. Is there that a crime to do that? Yeah, technically, we'll get into it a little bit, but there was like some gray area because this was the 80s and this kind of thing was pretty new. Hijack, like hacking and hijacking. Mm, yeah. So people weren't really sure what to do in this situation. Also, there was no clear motive. There was no clear culprit. It's like, why would someone do this? The character who appeared seemed to be imitating a character called Max Headroom. Max Headroom was a TV show about a TV journalist living in a dystopian future. And he was supposed to look computer generated. So the actor was covered in prosthetics, which the hacker's mask kind of mimicked. So people recognize this character as Max Headroom. And also the character on TV had this stripy computerized background behind him, which the hacker seemed to be trying to mimic with that metal. And I have a picture of Max Headroom so we can kind of compare them. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. His chin... His cheekbones are just like that. Even his hair. Yeah, maybe it was just a Max Headroom mask and the background is very similar. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, you know, Max Headroom was a pretty popular TV show at the time. So people kind of automatically recognized what this was parodying. And Max Headroom itself, the show was a parody of news broadcasting. It was basically like a satirical commentary about how the news was turning into something that was more entertaining than informative. And so possibly this hacker was making some kind of a political statement, especially intercepting the news with this thing, but no one was really sure. It, it was just kind of confusing. <laughs> you sound like a parent of a teenager talking about their really like artsy child. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you went to their art fair and you're like, something happened. Yeah. He was we trying, don't know. <laughs> he was trying to do something, but the overall feeling was confusion. <laughs> it was clear what he was attempting to possibly achieve. Yeah, yeah. we're not sure. Yeah. We're not sure. It was clear there was an attempt. What that attempt was is unclear. And it's unclear if we want to know. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. The newsroom immediately suspected that this was a inside job because uh, you would need a lot of skill and technology, like very specific skill and technology in order to make this happen. So they they suspected it was an inside job and immediately locked down and searched the studio. I really hope it's an inside job. <laughs> I love inside jobs when I'm not involved. <laughs> <laughs> when have you ever been involved in an inside job? I've not, but I can imagine that I would hate it. <laughs> so you love all inside jobs. 
I guess you're not so, involved in but any I of just, that. I just want to make it very clear that I have not sabotaged <laughs> <laughs> or been inside an inside job. Yeah, you're trying to keep your I may have been your an civilian. external job. Right. <laughs> I just want to be a lady who does a podcast and uh-huh. has a job. Uh-huh. Not on the inside, though. <laughs> I don't want to be a lady that has a podcast and has been fired from her job. <laughs> Precisely. Yes. I would like to resign. No, I'm not saying oh. I would <laughs> like to resign. I'm saying if if anyone's getting fired and is doing firing, it's going to be me. <laughs> All right. I would not like to resign. Do not come for me. I would Haley's like to keep principal, my job. are you hearing this? No. <laughs> no. If you are, stop listening right now. <laughs> Ew, get away. <laughs> okay. Um, they didn't find anything. And then just two hours later, the hacker made another appearance. It was at 11.15 p.m., this time on Channel 11. <gasps> what does it mean? I don't know. 11 and 11. What? Numbers. On Channel 11? It and started it was on Channel 15. 9. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. It, it, I mean, it probably means 11, 11, just... make a wish. Ah, I wish I was on the inside of an inside job so I could tell it on a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) This was the local PBS channel, and it was airing an episode of Doctor Who. Suddenly, it went to static. The screen went black, and VHS lines flashed across it. Do you remember what those look like? They're Mm kind of like sketchy gray lines. And the same hacker popped back up on the screen. This time, it's a little different. The video had audio this time. It was shaky and distorted. If you listen to it, you can barely understand what he's saying, if at all. But, you know, people have really analyzed it and figured it out. So he starts out by saying, he's a freaking nerd. I think I'm better than Chuck Swirsky, freaking liberal. And Chuck Swirsky was a Chicago Bulls announcer and sportscaster. (laughs) Wow. Did this? Wait, his name is Chuck? Chuck, yeah. Oh, we got like two the, Chucks the head in one of the episode. bounty hunter guy. Yeah, wow. This guy probably like slept with the hacker guy's like wife or something. What? Oh, he the hacker I'm, guy. I'm better than I him. thought you like, said the packer guy. I'm like, what? I mean, what maybe that, that too. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe because he was really calling him out here, and maybe he just has something about, against sportscasters. I don't know. Anyway, Maybe. <laughs> he then uh, holds up a Pepsi and while holding up this Pepsi, he yells the Coke slogan, catch the wave. And uh, this was another reference to uh, Max Headroom because Max Headroom was a spokesman, the character for Coca-Cola at the time. So he was like making fun of the character by holding up a Pepsi and saying the Coke slogan. It's very clever. And then he hums the theme. I'm glad you explained that. I mean, it was very clever. Here's how you should feel about yeah, it. Yeah, it was not at all. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, if you can't tell. And then he hums the theme for the television show, Clutch Cargo. Oh, I hate it when people hum. Really? Hate it. I don't want to hear other people hum, like especially if they're bad. <laughs> Maybe good singers. How I, I would often hear a good do you hum. hear people hum? Well, there's someone in, in my life who hums very poorly, like when they don't know the words to songs, and it's just like, just don't. Maybe just yeah. like don't. Yeah, maybe. Sorry just, if I'm like calling some people out, but <laughs> no, no, no. I I wholeheartedly agree with you. Just, <laughs> just why sing it. Sing your song in your head. It's like scream in your heart. Like, <laughs> right. sing in your head. I love to sing in the car when I'm alone. I'm not going to subject other people to it unless, like, they're into it. It's like a road right. trip and unless everybody's it's on like board. A fun time. You don't want to be the only person singing in the no. car. No, 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 no. no, no. We got to read the car. Yeah, read the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. We just like lose so many followers. I know. <laughs> Hot take. Anyway. This just gets weirder. So then he holds up, like he gives the middle finger, but it's not his middle finger. His middle finger is inside what appears to be a hollowed out dildo. <laughs> I thought you were going to say hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... A dildo, though. Yeah. But like, we're not, we're not sure, but that's what it looks like. And then he screams, your love is fading, and throws the dildo onto the floor. And then he says, I can see the X, which is another reference to Clutch Cargo. And I looked up Clutch Cargo. The plot, like, didn't really, 
like make sense in the context of this story. So I'm not sure why he was referencing it. But what I did notice is that the character Clutch Cargo, I don't know if that's his name or what, but on the main character looks a lot like the mask. And I have a picture of it here for you to see. So there's the mask and then there's Clutch Cargo. Yeah, are all these characters just based off of each other or what? I don't know. <laughs> and the, or are they just a bunch of white guys? <laughs> I that's probably what it is. White guys <laughs> with big chins. But and when I was looking at up Clutch Cargo, I guess the animation was pretty groundbreaking at the time and they incorporated live action with the animation and it was like a very like I, if you were like a techie and really liked that stuff, you probably would have like admired this show Clutch Cargo. So maybe that's what this was. Then he went on to pretend to poop and he said, I just made a masterpiece for the greatest world newspaper nerds. And the greatest world newspaper was like another reference to the news because they called themselves that whatever. And then he held up a glove just a single glove, and said, my brother's wearing the other one, but it's dirty. It's got blood stains on it. <gasps> Ooh. So it got kind of creepy. And then the video cuts out really quick and then cuts back in. And this time the hacker or like the guy on camera is bent over. He's sideways to the camera and he has his pants pulled down and his bare butt is out. And I watched the video and it almost looks like a fake butt. Like either that or he has like a very smooth voluptuous butt. <laughs> I remember um, going to a race, like a running race, uh -huh. but people were running and they had on these like fake butts. Like a bunch <laughs> of people did. I don't know if they were just like giving them out like, ha ha. Like, yeah. I don't know what it was, but I was like, what the heck is yeah. going on? <laughs> Why does everyone have a huge butt? Yeah. And where's mine? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like a fake butt. But just for Me fun. Too. Yeah, one that I can take on and off. Yeah, yeah, Like, yeah. I'm happy with what I've got. <laughs> I don't need any more, but... <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, but sometimes you're feeling spicy. <laughs> anyway, he has his fake butt out. Maybe it's his real butt. I don't know. I'm not trying to accuse him of anything. And he <laughs> says, they're coming to get me. And then a woman is on screen with him, and her face is... Uh, not in the picture, but she says, bend over, bitch, and starts swatting his butt with a fly swatter. What if this whole thing was just completely by accident and this couple <laughs> is like acting out their craziest fantasies? They just don't even know. <laughs> it's like someone who like lives in the apartment building across from them is just like... <laughs> sick of their weird shit and like broadcast it to get them to stop yes they're like they're gonna be so embarrassed and probably arrested yeah <laughs> that'd be amazing <laughs> then the guy yells come get me bitch and he keeps screaming just like random stuff and then like his screaming gets more and more distorted and like computery sounding like just like messed up and then the video and audio cut out and the Doctor Who show just resumes. At both TV stations, the phones were ringing off the hook. People were freaked out. They wanted to know what was going on. Both the incidents were so short, though. So the first was only 30 seconds, and the second one was only a minute and 22 seconds. So as soon as they started looking into it and trying to figure it out, it was over. And there was a mixture between people thinking it was funny, people being freaked out and also people being pissed because mm -hmm. of course this is the 80s like you there wasn't Netflix like if your Doctor Who show got interrupted you were going to be mad and, right. and you can't just go to the internet to see what people are, are saying on Twitter. No. you and Yeah, you're confused. Like, you have to call the station. And, and you don't want to call someone. No, I don't want to call anyone. <laughs> and, like, so one woman called and she was mad because she was, like, taping the Doctor Who special to watch back later. And, like, she like had to tape it again and like well it, she had the tape of this guy now which is apparently a, a much better event. i'm just like yeah why would you complain like how is doctor who better than this yeah she needs to 
check herself. Yeah, she does. Seriously. But I mean, most people recognize this for what it was, which was a crazy thing that they were lucky to see and that it was really funny. Also, this is before <laughs> the World Wide Web. This was people's first taste of this kind of just blatant yeah. trolling. You're lucky when you see it on TV and it interrupts Doctor Who, but when you see it on the street from someone who's mentally unwell, you're like, ugh. This guy. Yeah, I don't want anyone doing that in front of me in person, but by all <laughs> means, do it on my TV. <laughs> Let me pause it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take some screenshots. <laughs> Let me take notes. Where, can I get that put on Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> it did look good. People thought it was funny, but the government did not. They took it very seriously. <laughs> they never do. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> such stick in the muds about the stupidest things. Right. Wet blanket alert. <laughs> Someone called Tommy and Alec. Um, <laughs> or your pants. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. That, well, your pants, you said, are. <laughs> her pants are wet and she's, yeah, they're not okay. dry all the way. That okay. sounded so <laughs> wrong. Like, yeah. You're making this I sound am, so much worse than it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm really. Uh, My pants sorry. are not wet. <laughs> um, I'm wearing leather pants. <laughs> That I didn't put in the dryer because after I was done washing them because they're leather and I didn't want to put them in the dryer and ruin them. And they were a little bit damp when I put them on. And (laughs) as I'm sure you can imagine, leather pants do not breathe very well. So I'm very uncomfortable right now. And it's also very hot in this room because we can't have the window or the fan because we're recording. So you guys are welcome for this good audio right now at the expense of our comfort. (laughs) And uh, I shouldn't have worn leather pants, bottom line, because they're now sweaty from my sweat and from residual washing machine. I just think it's really relatable. Like the amount of times that I woke up for school and forgot to like change my laundry from the night before from the washer to the dryer and then can just dry it for like 20 minutes and have to put on jeans that day. Yeah. Because I only want like I only want to wear one pair of jeans because I'm a middle schooler and then I just go to school with wet pants. Because yeah. I'm a middle schooler who's stubborn. Yeah, we've all been there. I don't know why I insisted on wearing these pants today. I think that, oh, I know why. Because I bought them recently and now the weather's hot. And I'm like, when will I have a chance to wear my leather pants again for a very long time? And today was kind of cool. So I was like, this is my chance to get one more use out of the leather pants before summer. That's well, why there you them. go. Yes. Congratulations. You've made a mistake. <laughs> I have. My, I'm very sweaty. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, the FBI and Chicago's FCC got to work investigating. The maximum penalty for this kind of crime was a fine of $100,000 a year in jail or both. And this was actually a really new law because hijacking TV stations was brand new. It required, like, especially in the 80s, a lot of very expensive equipment and very specific expertise. Like, in order to be a techie and a hacker, you really had to go the extra mile and learn it through other people. There, the, You couldn't just go on the internet and look this stuff up. I wonder how many times this hacker, like failed at doing it so he's constantly like getting this background set up and like putting the mask (laughs) on and like getting his like you know whoever's who's like spanking him or whatever do you think they (laughs) practice yes absolutely yeah they definitely practice i mean they probably had a lot of fun honestly i would hope so at the expense like all the work they went through they had to have had fun. Yeah, this whole thing, like, my my understanding of this was it was for fun. I hope it was worth it. <laughs> I, it, it, it was. <laughs> and, you know, if you were going to be doing this kind of thing in the 80s, you the way it worked was you would send a signal from a satellite dish that was strong enough to override the TV station's signal. And that sounds easy enough, but you'd have to get your positioning right. You'd have to do research on where their signal was, which at the time, you know, it was not too easy of a task. It was hard to do. So this possibility of hacking into television broadcasts was not something people really thought much about. Like how how could someone even acquire the knowledge and the equipment to do this until it happened in 1986. So a year before this Max Headroom hijacking. It happened during an HBO TV show called The Falcon and the Snowman. During the broadcast, color bars appeared on the screen with text over top. And I have a picture of it. It read, Good evening, HBO, from Captain Midnight. $12.95 a month? No way! Showtime Movie Channel, beware. 
And <laughs> this hack lasted four and a half minutes with this on the screen. And it was pretty clearly a protest of the network's recently announced price increase. Someone was not happy about that. Yeah. I mean, how much does ne- Netflix cost? Like $7 at the most basic level. Yeah. And HBO nowadays costs about this much. Like yeah. $12 and that was in the month. 80s. Uh-huh. So it was expensive. Yeah. And this was uh, America's first known broadcast signal hack. And it really did freak people out because <laughs> now they knew it was possible. And this one wasn't too bad, but it could have more malicious content in the future, possibly from other government agencies. You know, like it could definitely get worse. Yeah. And I love that it says from Captain Midnight. Right. He's like just that. calling himself Captain Midnight. I don't know if that's a reference to something, but I think it was just what this guy was calling Completely himself. Completely unnecessary. Yeah, truly. And they did end up catching this person. His name was not Captain Midnight. It was Joe McDougal. No, John McDougal. What? <laughs> <laughs> and he was a satellite technician. Investigators were able to catch him by tracking the program he used in order to display the text. So by looking at this color bars, they could tell what program he used. What an idiot. I know. And they were able to trace this to his employer, which was Central Florida Teleport in Ocala, Florida. So he was a Florida man. And (laughs) (laughs) they always are. I know. And he did this. He did this at the end of his own work shift at his uh, place of work. He just flipped the direction of the satellite and uh, toured the satellite of the the HBO and broadcasted his own message. Why would you not just pretend to be looking for a job at some other network and then on your first day on the job do that? And then never show up again. Yeah, he should have not known, get caught. He should have known he was going to lose his job for this, and much worse. He, but like the he, HBO prices were too high, though they were too high. Something had to be done. And the thing was, is he had this business of selling satellite equipment, and HBO's prices going up meant he wasn't going to be selling as many satellites, and so it really was affecting him. And he was very angry and <laughs> decided this was the way to get what he wanted. Spoiler alert. It was not the way to get what he wanted. Instead, he pled guilty to charges and had to pay a $5,000 fine and serve a year of probation. Wow. He didn't have to go to jail, though? No. Thankfully, no jail, but... Just half a million dollars? No, $5,000. Oh, I thought you said $500,000. No, 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 no. no. Not that much. I mean, still, (laughs) $5,000. Right. That's almost worse, because I can imagine $5,000, but $500,000 is, like, so outside of my realm of reality. Yeah, you're like, I could (laughs) pay $5,000, and it would suck, but if I got a $500,000 charge, I would never pay that. I I would would just live with bad credit <laughs> i would just declare bankruptcy yeah. instantly like that's a no-brainer yeah it's like that's not even an amount of money i would pay <laughs> and it was it was hard to charge him on this because there was ambiguity because there was no law for this exact crime he was charged with transmitting without a license and a year later so still but still before the headroom incident the law was enacted again for a very similar attack So in September of 1987, Playboy TV was hacked and they broadcasted messages telling people to repent and find Jesus. Oh, my God. That's like all those huge signs on the highway that are like, hell is real. And you're going there. (laughs) It's just like, why? Why do you care? I don't know. Like, I don't don't have anything else to to care about. Yeah. (laughs) It's going to be warm like the beach. Yeah. I'm there. I'm going to be tan. It's going to be great. Yeah. Send me, send me there. All my friends will be there. I'll be there um, with them. Lil Nas X is there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going there. Um, amen. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI found the hacker who did this, and it was a man named Thomas Haney, and he worked for the Christian Broadcasting <laughs> Network. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, it, it was convicted under the same law as McDougal, but he was only sentenced to probation. I don't think he had to pay a fine. But the Max Headroom hacker was more elusive than these other guys. He was smarter and savvier. They couldn't find him as easily. The theory was that this hacker would have had to overpower the microwaves at the TV stations, which 
would have been he would have pretty like easily found the TV stations because they were located at the top of the John Hancock building and Sears Tower. So they were at two of the most noticeable points in the city. Okay. So he could have aimed at them pretty easily. I'm an idiot because you said he needed to overpower the microwaves. And I thought you meant like the kitchen appliance. And I was like, that makes sense. Like it probably <laughs> interferes. With, <laughs> it probably interferes with like, like the just... connection for the satellites <laughs> if they're using it. He just like puts tin foil in a microwave and sets it to 10 minutes. That's how... <laughs> Listen, wow. I never said that I was a genius. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. It's hot in here. It I'm is getting hot in delusional. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. The you're also drinking a very strong beer right now. And uh, by the way, a delicious beer. This is my new favorite beer. Yeah. And we are not sponsored by that. It's amazing. Wa- Wonderland Nectarine Ale. Yeah, it's fucking good. And it's like 7.5%. So in order to intercept these uh, broadcasts from the top of these towers, the hacker would have also had to be really, really high up, like almost as high so that he could get a direct line to those towers. So probably on top of an apartment building. And it would have had to be somewhere downtown between the two transmitters. Investigators think this could have been possible to do with pretty affordable equipment. So they found out that you can buy broadcasting equipment used on like the market for pretty low prices. So it could have just been your average show on top of their apartment building. They would have needed a dish antenna, but a direct TV sized antenna would have been enough. He didn't need something massive. And so the FBI and FCC were able to narrow their scope to north, the north and northeast parts of the city. They also, by looking at the video, were able to find some clues about the location. Because they had that spinning industrial-sized metal in the background, they figured this must be somewhere like a warehouse. <laughs> Can you imagine being one of the people who had this on VCR and you gave it to law enforcement agents? I would feel so involved with that case like oh, I'd be yeah. calling them every day and I'd be like hey what's the deal with our case <laughs> like <laughs> I, know. I would feel like I was a member on the team and they'd be like god this lady again. right get away from us but it was cool like the people who do have this tape like feel cool and like you'll go on online forums and see people talking about it and being like I have one of whatever like it is real. it is like a cool piece cool. of history and uh, What the FBI and FCC would have had to do was, so they narrowed down the part of the city. They would have had to find places with this type of metal. They could probably narrow their scope to warehouses. And uh, the game plan was to, you know, go knock on doors and ask people if they had seen anything unusual. However, the FBI was not making it a priority. They didn't really care, and they stopped investigating. And the FCC in Chicago was also dragging their feet because this was the type of case that they weren't used to doing. It was out of the ordinary, and quite frankly, it just seemed like more work, and they didn't want to knock on doors. Relatable. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Every part of what you just said, relatable. Absolutely. I wouldn't want to either. I don't want to talk to strangers. I don't want to do anything. No, I want to do what I'm used to doing and nothing extra. I just want to do this podcast and like teach some kids. Yeah. (laughs) My, My two things. Knocking on doors, not one of them. No. And the FCC agreed. It was also not considered that serious of a crime. No one died. No one was in danger. No expensive equipment was in danger. Yeah, they're like, you can't prove that was a real butt. So (laughs) (laughs) that's the biggest offense of this whole thing. (laughs) It is. And I'm sure like Mm -hmm. in the 80s, like in sitcoms, they still did they still have like parents sleeping in separate beds? Stuff like that. No, they didn't. Okay, when did that end? Like. (laughs) 79? It was either I Love Lucy or Bewitched or something that was the first show to show a husband and wife sleeping together. I Love Lucy was separate for a while, but I think at the end of the series, they pushed the beds together. (laughs) When was I Love Lucy out? That started in the 50s. Oh, okay. So it was a little while. Okay. Yeah. But still, I'm pretty sure they weren't showing butts on TV, even (laughs) fake ones. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, 
the case ended up going cold. No one just wanted to investigate. It wasn't made a priority. The FCC may have abandoned the case, but popular culture and internet chat rooms never did. Since the Max Headroom hacked, the concept of hijacking a news broadcast to spread some sort of message, especially while wearing a mask, has been incredibly popular in movies. Like, I'm sure we've all seen it. I can't think of any examples right now, but you all know what I'm talking about. That feels like something from The Purge, but also I don't really remember the purge yeah but it seems like something that would happen in the purge the purge <laughs> is what comes into my mind too but i don't think they ever like maybe hijacked it's just the mask cast. yeah i think it might be the masks but like just you know this idea of you're watching the news and then like a, a unknown figure commandeers it to say some sort of like cryptic message we've all seen that <laughs> i would have thought that i was just like too lit that night and I would not talk about it to anyone oh yeah I would be I'd be so scared imagine thinking you're alone and like you said earlier like now you can just go on Twitter and like be like what is that but like back then people were like really freaked out you probably did think you were seeing things yeah I mean that's like in the 50s when they did like that what was it like Twilight Zone or something Mm -hmm. did that like alien invasion episode and people thought that that, like aliens were actually invading the world it'd be scary so stupid of them (laughs) so stupid (laughs) but yeah people are really interested in this and they've come up with their own theories about the actual case so there's you know this person was never caught but there's all these internet theories rolling around there's two really predominant theories the first is that this was a performance artist and musician named eric fournier and Years after the hack, Eric created a YouTube series called Shane St. John, which uh, people noticed looked very similar to the Max Headroom video. So they started to theorize that Eric did this video. And at the time, he was in a punk band called The Blood Farmers. And they, I know. AKA vampires. Right. (laughs) AKA any farmer of animals. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's true. They have blood. <laughs> it's uh, a stretch, but we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> and when I think farmers, I think of like carrots and radishes. Okay. But yeah, farmers of animals. Yeah, farmers, is true. Animals. Yeah. Anyway, the idea was that maybe he was trying to get publicity for his band and he was going to play one of his band's music videos and then chickened out last minute and just improvised this weird performance instead. However, his bandmates at the time like say that this is absolute bullshit because they were in high school. They didn't know anything about video editing and they didn't have any of this expensive equipment that would have been necessary. And Eric can't comment on the rumor because he sadly passed away in 2010. But overall, this does not seem like the, a very likely theory, especially that they were in high school. Mm hmm. The second theory was proposed by a computer programmer named Bowie J. Polk. And he I love that name. I know. He <laughs> has a perfect name. And he posted his theory on Reddit years later as an adult. But at the time of the attack, he was 13 years old. And he was this nerdy 13-year-old who ended up becoming part of a group of older hackers. And in the 80s, like being a com- like a techie computer nerd, it wasn't the same as it is now. Like you were really an outcast and you had to seek out your people not only socially like for social reasons but in order to learn this stuff because it's not like you're taught this in school yeah and if you didn't have access to like a shared computer or something like Mm -hmm. that you would have to buy one and they were super expensive definitely and so like these people really formed communities and they would meet up in gatherings and uh, what's his face Pogue was at one of these gatherings where he met a man named Jay and Pogue refers to this man as J, just like the initial J in his post. He wants to keep him anonymous. And uh, J was in his 30s. He was very socially awkward, kind of described as childlike, like maybe a little bit developmentally younger than his actual age. He was obsessed with electronics and was really, really into broadcasting technology. He was also close with and lived with his brother, who was also into the same things and also a hacker. They were kind of like this popular duo in the group because they were so good at what they did. 
And remember in the video, he says his brother is wearing the other glove. Mm -hmm. So that might be a little hint. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sounded like he murdered his brother. It did. It did. <laughs> or that they murdered someone together. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pogue says that when he watches this video, he just sees Jay. He's pretty sure it's him. Pogue was at a hacker event the night of the broadcast and he remembers being there and he, he was 13 with all these older guys and so he says that he was always just like quiet and kind of a wallflower like he was excited just to be there and he tried not to like say too much in fear of like being kicked out you know like mm -hmm. he just wanted to be there and so he was uh, told in passing that night like to watch channel 7 later or oh. I'm sorry not channel 7 channel 11 later. Obviously, yeah, it was him. And he says that at the time, it didn't really click until he was much older that he he was being told about this. I mean, he was Aww, 13. That's cute. Yeah. But then when it clicked, he was like, oh, my God, like this makes so much sense. And the guy in the video and his mannerisms just reminded him of this guy, Jay. That's like when you finally figure out the lyrics to a song you've been singing since you were 13 years <laughs> <Right>? old. <laughs> so true like it must have been such a revelation and as soon as he had this revelation he posted his theory on reddit and it blew up pogue has reached out to jay and his brother for comment but both of them like ignore like they do not pick up the phone they well, do not answer them. emails if they're just gonna ignore it yeah and pogue says like they probably just want to be left alone like they were both super socially awkward did not like attention they probably just want to stay out of the limelight also like there's possible legal repercussions on some of the charges they could be brought up on the statute of limitations has passed but there's like one charge i didn't write it down where they could still be held accountable so it's probably smart not to reveal their own identities yeah and uh, however, investigators who worked on the case reject this theory. They really maintain that it was most likely someone who worked at the broadcast station, which I don't really agree with. I, I mean, would I don't wonder what would prompt somebody to to do this who worked yeah. at a broadcast station. And it's just like, why wouldn't it be someone else? Like, it sounds like it's definitely possible to do this not from a broadcast station, especially if you're an accomplished hacker and techie like these guys yeah. were. I feel like people who research this intensely want it to be a really intricate mm -hmm. explanation that it would have to be an inside job. Yeah, yeah, that might be it. And also like just like lost cause fallacy like you they really leaned on that theory that it was an inside job in the beginning and so they're just kind of sticking with it but ultimately we don't know who did it no one has ever come forward other television hacks have happened since the max headroom incident but none is iconic or bizarre my mom knew about this i saw her nodding um, when i brought it up and seeing that mask so people who lived at the time like this is as iconic as like a guy fox mask like it it is something and it's been brought up in a pop culture over and over again and uh, also brought up on the internet it's all over reddit people love to theorize about it and that was the max headroom signal hijacking thanks again to my student isaias wow that is so cool and i love a mystery an unsolved mystery that doesn't include like murder yeah yeah <laughs> that's it's a really fun nice mystery <laughs> it's so happy um i once again want to cite my uh, predominant source um it is an article called the mystery of the creepiest television hack by chris niddle i backed this up on other sources and also got some more information from all that's interesting.com and wikipedia and that was my learning journey wow amazing thank you so much this episode was so fun thank you to theo and stephanie for being here with us and being our live audience our first live show <laughs> in person Wow. Yeah. That's quite an accomplishment. Big things are happening over here. We got my mom who wants to watch us. <laughs> anyway, thank you to everyone who's not my mom who listened to this. If you enjoyed this, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Tell a friend about us. Follow us on social media. And maybe even check out our Patreon. Thank you again for listening. And three, two, one, class dismissed. All right, it's time for your joke, Theo. You know which one to push? Hey, Kat, do you look under there? Under where? <laughs> waka, oh. waka, waka. Oh, oh good job. <laughs> awesome. 
And as per the usual, I was totally wrong about I Love Lucy being the first it shared seems like in guess. the family. Yay! <laughs> we're both a couple of idiots. Also, uh, I love that you were calling me out a couple days ago about how I always say yeah. the wrong thing on the podcast. And I'm like, well, it's hard when you're on the spot to so, say the right thing. And now you did it. So, so okay, you know I really like. did know the right thing. I was <laughs> oh, trying I'm to make sure. you feel good. Uh huh. But um, I Love Lucy was the first birth. And the Bradys were really the big groundbreaker sharing the bed. But that's so messed up to hide something on television that's so natural. That is the reason why we exist. Birth. Right. The yeah. human experience of birth. Also, like they didn't show her giving birth, right? It was just like she was no, pregnant no, and now she, she was had a baby. Pregnant and they followed that whole story, which yeah. was unheard of. To have like a actual because she was actually pregnant oh. with Desi Arnaz's child uh-huh. in the show, so yeah, that was the first one. Wow! But it was weird because they would go to bed in these teeny weeny tiny <laughs> twin beds that were like way separated from one another <laughs> at night. Like they'd kiss each other good night and then hop into their separate beds. It's it like very almost weird. kinkier that yeah. she was knocked up and they were in twin beds. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. How did that happen? Well, like you keep one bed for the dirty bed and then you get to sleep in the dry bed and not in the wet. The dry bed. Like the dry bed. I <laughs> think they're both, idea. they're both for sleeping in a different location completely is for yeah. baby Well, making. I, yeah. I'm not going to say anymore. But yeah. All right. <laughs> anyway, that, that's, that, that's all, folks. <laughs> bye. 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 Here's Theo. Say bye. Bye. <laughs>